Hello, my name is Father Boniface. I'm a Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And I'm so grateful to have the chance to talk with Father Mike Fakes of the Diocese of Pittsburgh as we discuss Pope Francis's homily from the, the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, September 14th, 2022. And it was given at the Expo Grounds in Kazakhstan as part of his apostolic journey. We heard that homily in the first part of our program, and Father Mike and I will be discussing it and sharing it with you now for the remainder of the hour. Father Mike, thanks for being with me. It's great to talk with you. Absolutely. I'm very blessed to be able to be with you and discuss this, uh, this wonderful topic. So thanks for having me. And let's turn to Our Lady for a moment and ask for her prayers for us as we discuss the cross of her son that Our Lady of Sorrows in a particular way would pray for us to focus our discussion on what the Lord wants us to talk about and that she would also pray for our listeners that they would hear what the Lord wants to say to them. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, Father Mike, I always like to give our guest a chance to just open up the uh, conversation with anything that stood out to you or any particular starting point that you would want to enter into, uh, maybe your response to the, the homily as a whole. Anyway, any uh, any initial responses from you to, to start us off? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I appreciate uh, Pope Francis's insights into these things a lot of times. Uh, one of the things that I think that he's he's good at is being able to draw out the kind of contrasts that we see both within Scripture and uh, the beautiful imagery. Uh, you know, he, he starts off by, by saying that the cross is a gibbet of death, and yet today we celebrate. So there's something about, you know, that contrast of, uh, you know, this was an instrument of, of torture and, and death and suffering, and yet there is, there is joy in this day. There is celebration. There is exaltation. And so there's a naturally, uh, within the human soul, a, a kind of tornness, you know, about, uh, about this, because there is suffering, uh, and even within the human condition, and yet we look to uh, this feast and, and the victory over all sin and death. And so there is a celebratory nature in all of this. It's just beautiful. Absolutely. And that's always the paradox of the cross, that we have this instrument of death, which is also an instrument of victory, that which was the greatest suffering, the greatest evil that mankind ever witnessed, the very murder of God becomes for us the, the doorway of salvation and the passageway of into eternal life. And so there's, there's always a paradox caught up in that. And uh, I, I agree with you about Pope Francis making these things accessible. And of course, he's in the midst of Kazakhstan as he's giving this homily. And so he draws in the experience of the people he's preaching to in a particular way. But I think it also has a, a number of lessons for us as we look at those different dimensions of the cross. It's the different dimensions of suffering in our own lives, those uh, dimensions that can be, uh, that are painful, but also can be salutary, can be salvific for us. Yeah, certainly. So he, he's uh, speaking within the context, uh, obviously, of that country. And at one point he does point to the obvious fact that there are desert lands in Kazakhstan, and, uh, you know, but one does not have to live in a literal desert to, to know and experience a kind of deserted feeling and feeling of sort of desolate, uh, you know, because it was the Israelites in the desert uh, and, and wandering, journeying, that we have that scene within the book of Numbers uh, of, of the serpents, and that's mostly what he focuses on, that, that difference between these, these kinds of serpents and all that happened there, but... Uh, certainly one does not have to live in a, a desert in order to experience desert and desertedness. Uh, and so this is very applicable to, to really any person, and how often it's the case that within our own suffering is sometimes whenever we feel that desertedness and desolation uh, most poignantly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, it makes me think, too, of the what Pope Benedict called the spiritual desertification that we experience in our times as our society has really become such a wasteland of, of spirituality, of uh, a religious sense of the, the presence uh, or, or even a belief in the existence of God. We've just created 
wastelands and and like the physical desert things just don't grow there mm -hmm. and the things that grow there to the contrary are things that are often uh, quite disagreeable as serpents and scorpions and cacti and uh, pointy defensive things that are poisonous and bite those are the things that can survive in the desert and I, I think it happens very much in the spiritual deserts that we've created as well the the, the predators and the the porn industry and the online gambling and all these vices have a way of really ruling the day and mm -hmm. create such an unpleasant environment. And actually looking at that, paying attention to that is part of the, part of the remedy, be, being honest about it, uh, looking at it like the Israelites looked at the serpent in the desert. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, um, I was actually just the other day, uh, talking with a number of students uh, actually about Ignatius of Loyola and the, the rules for discernment. And it's amazing how, that within the, the first and second rule uh, of what Ignatius is, is discussing, he, he discusses two different persons, really, in the first rule, people who are really going from mortal sin to mortal sin and is moving away from God. And, of course, the voice of, of the enemy in that case is continually throwing out uh, pleasures and and encouraging more, but it's actually the, the, the voice of God who tends to be pricking, biting at their consciences, you know, through the process of reason, he says. But really for anyone striving for God, and this is within the second rule, striving for God, uh, it tends to be the, the enemy that, that he says uh, the evil spirit will bite, sadden, and put obstacles, disquieting with false reason. So, uh, it's amazing how that can be applied to this kind of, uh, the, the two serpents, you know, really the Pope Francis talk about the, the serpents that bite and the serpent that saves, uh, you know, that there is, just depending on, on where we are, where we are as individual persons and where we are as a culture, that if as a culture we're, we're very desolate, it, it's possible that, that, that sometimes those biting and stingings are, are actually like meant to sort of get us, get us back, get our, our, our attention uh, and mm. realize that we are, we're not living it, we're, we're not well, we're not alive. And so in a manner of speaking, these, these initial serpents that were sent to the Israelites who, who were biting, and, biting and, and poisoning, sure, there is a kind of uh, evil there, but there is a sort of, hey, you know, grabbing of, of attention, and, and what do they do? They turn to God. So there is something there as far as, okay, in the desert, there is still opportunity to encounter God uh, and, to, and to meet him face to face. Yeah, that's right. That's a great application with the, uh, the first rule for St. Ignatius, that biting and stinging of consciences. Interestingly, I was also presenting that just the other day to the seminarians here, so <laughs> we're, uh, we're quite on the same page. Yeah. And uh, Pope, uh, sorry, St. Ignatius also talks about the way that uh, even when we're moving along in that second rule path, moving from good to better, trying intensely, purifying ourselves of our vices, uh, we have those moments that we fall back. It's one of the reasons for uh, desolation as described by rule number nine in the first week rules. And, and that is a similar kind of experience that even though we're moving primarily in the right direction, we end up with uh, a little desolation that also has a way of biting and pricking our consciences and waking us up to ask the question, did I go astray? Did I stop my, change my spiritual plan in some way? Am I, am I compromising on that? Is there something in my heart that has, uh, has gotten off track that needs to change? And uh, you're, you're so right, Father Mike, that those are the things that can wake us up and, and help us to, to move back. It's a little like rumble strips, you might say, on the, on the road. We notice that we're starting to drift and uh, those rumble strips have a way of waking us up a bit and getting us back between the, uh, back in the lanes in order to keep making progress in the spiritual journey. Yeah, it's beautiful imagery. And, you know, what, what's amazing about those qu kind of questions as well is, am I doing something wrong? Am I living it? Am I really growing closer to God? You know what? They're good questions. <laughs> they're actually very good questions. But I, I, I think that there can be sometimes, especially for people who are ardently striving for God and, and hopefully making progress, that it's important to not be obsessed with those questions uh, or, or so overly concerned that we become more consumed with uh, 
our own, the state of our own soul with, rather than just being simply focused on God. But they are good questions and important questions for us to ask as a people. You know, it's, it's, I wish more people were asking those kinds of questions. Uh, am I growing closer to God? Am I doing this right? Am I growing closer? So uh, these are good questions, and I think that amidst the desert and amidst the difficulty, trial, whatever that might mean, especially on this feast, the, uh, the exaltation of the Holy Cross, uh, looking to our own crosses as well, and and sharing those with the Lord, because ultimately, uh, that's what this this raising of the bronze serpent in the desert was, and kind of representing that that gazing upon, and so uh, gazing upon the Lord and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus is ultimately what God is is wanting for us, whether we're in spiritual consolation, spiritual desolation amidst the the desert of culture, or within uh, a, a beautiful and flourishing garden within. Uh, uh, families and church communities. Uh, either way, the goal still say, stays the same. You know, the goal is God, and we are to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. Yeah, well said. Beautiful. That's exactly right. The We don't constantly uh, ask the question or, or dig up the seed is the way I think of it. You know, we, we plant the seed of faith, we move forward. Uh, but when things are dying, when things are hurting, when there's that uh, biting that's happening, the Israelites uh, were, were going along, and as Pope Francis described it, they had steadily lost their trust in God. And Pope Francis points us back to that original serpent that in Eden tempted Adam and Eve and really tempted them not to trust God. That's the fundamental temptation is that to, to think that God is not a good father, that he doesn't have our best interest in mind, that he's even envious of our happiness and he wants to take something away from us. That's the fundamental temptation. And as that poison of original sin, as Pope Benedict described it in an early homily in his pontificate, that drop of poison from original sin that makes us distrust God, as, as that gets more and more of a grip on us, then uh, we can we can really go astray. And then God is helping us by allowing us to experience the consequences of that. When we start to distrust God, a lot of other things start to fall apart because we, we really need him. And so we can be grateful for those, those wake-up calls and then to ask that question simply. And, and our starting point may not be just, oh, I trust God now. Our starting point may be addressing the very thing that led to the distrust. And that's part of the point in this story is facing the serpent, looking at it squarely and saying, well, maybe it was the loss of, of my child and I didn't understand and I was angry with God and I, I don't trust him anymore. I've seen him take away things that are important to me and I've seen the difficulties. I look at the world and I say, where is God? Why has he let all these things happen? You know, maybe that's the reason for our distrust. Well, then we can face it and bring it up with him. Ask him. Speak about it, address it, feel the pain, and as as we do that, we're able to address those uh, those serpents that are biting us, and and come to a place we we will actually discover the remedy in that way as we as we discover Christ in those questions. Yeah, absolutely. I I you know I was thinking about this this feast day, and actually. Um, I'm, a, I'm assigned to Triumph of the Holy Cross Parish, so I'm very uh, nice. privileged to be able to be uh, discussing this with you. Uh, and so leading up to the exaltation of the Holy Cross as a parish, we were praying in Novena, and uh, on Wednesday we had uh, relics of the true cross of Jesus Christ at, at each of our daily Masses for people to venerate. And, and you know, I, I say all of that because, of course, there is something beautiful and celebratory about this, but exactly what you were saying as far as you know people's sufferings and, and those questions, you know, there's there's so much, there's real suffering out there. And even just within our, our parish community and uh, as a parish priest, I'm, I'm often so humbled and, and privileged to be able to share in people's sufferings that they either come to us or, or, or to me to either, either discuss things or because they don't know where to turn, what to do. And... Suffering is inescapable, uh, and we each experience it in varying ways, varying degrees, but there's no doubt it is, it is very, very real. And so those kinds of questions of how could God permit this, why would God do this, uh, or he took this person from me, you know, I, I think exactly what you were saying is just a, a lot of times the best way to start to deal with that. You know, nothing is a quick fix uh, in this realm. 
but it's a question of, well, have you, have you shared that with God? Have you talked to God about that? Have you told him you're angry? Have you told him, you know, it's not as though God doesn't already know that, but us, us sharing that with him and sharing with him our sorrows actually draws us more deeply into uh, his sorrows, even Our Lady's sorrows, you know, uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows being the day after the exaltation of the Holy Cross. You know, Our Lady shared in his passion, you know, that compassion of Our Lady. And so, you know, this is the way that we actually not only share in the suffering of the cross and, and begin to take our sufferings to him, but share in his victory as well, uh, and going from within our lives, from uh, suffering to, to joy, uh, because joy comes in the morning. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, and uh, you know, thinking about the that whole process of of looking at the serpent, looking at the suffering, looking at what is what is causing his pain, instead of simply running away from it, uh, and then it has a way of following us, keeping up with us, to to really face it. The amazing thing that we discover in Christianity is that Christ is in it. He's in all suffering. He's in everything that has gone wrong. There is nothing that uh, that we suffer that Jesus doesn't also suffer with us. And when we look at it, we can find him in it. And as you said, Father Mike, discover the victory that's also in it, because Jesus takes that and he carries it the distance. But it, it gives us permission. Uh, sometimes we also have the misconception that if we sort of... Uh, use the Christian key in the right way on the lock of suffering, that it'll just kind of pop open and the suffering will go away. If we just said the right prayer, if we just had the right thought, if we just, you know, did the right thing, then the suffering would go away. Well, the suffering doesn't go away. <laughs> and uh, maybe there's a sense of that in this passage, too. The serpents don't go away. They they stop biting <laughs> in some way, but uh, but they're still there. And, and suffering is going to be a part of our life. But when we also are able to meet Christ in that suffering, then it gives us a reason for hope. It provides a meaning in that. It's not just a dead end, but is really something that uh, has, a, has a path forward as we carry some very heavy crosses, and, and not just by ourselves. I, I think that's the other challenge, is that we need to do that together, to support each other in carrying the, the crosses and bearing with the serpents and handling the situations that... Have, uh, that we found ourselves in. Yeah, certainly. I've I've heard it said that uh, you know there's no such thing as an easy life, but there is such a thing as an easy yoke. You know, and that that's really what Jesus mm. offers us. That there there is no life, uh, human life, without suffering. And whenever we think about human suffering or, or or think about our own suffering, a lot of times we become kind of consumed in it or, or obsessed with it. But if we look to Jesus Himself and realize. Jesus suffered, that, that God did not spare even his own son from, from suffering and death. It, it's kind of a game changer, you know, because, well, of all the people that, that walked this earth, you know, Jesus himself perhaps you know, could have exempted himself from, from suffering or death. Uh, you know, Elijah being uh, swept up into the heavens, you know, maybe the Son of God, maybe something like that could have happened, but this was the way that, that he, was, uh, he willingly surrendered to the will of the Father, uh, to take on suffering and death for our sake. And so it's not as though Jesus doesn't know. And I think that sometimes that's that's the trap that we fall into, is to think that God doesn't know or God doesn't understand. But Jesus understands suffering in every dimension. You know, even whenever it does come to human loss, I mean, John chapter 11, that the, the scene with Lazarus, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. It, it's, it's the shortest verse in the, in the entire Bible, just mm -hmm. two words, Jesus wept. And yet it's so profound. It says something so deep about his humanity, about his divinity, uh, that he is with us in our suffering. He knows the hardship of, of loss. He knows the hardship of the desert. He spent uh, 40 days in the desert himself, and then himself, of course, undergoing his passion and death. So it's not as though he, he doesn't know. He does. He's with us. And I think that the more that we as you said, kind of confront those and, and, and not simply just try to get away from them with, with this naive idea that if, if only we did this or if only our state of life was that, that, that there wouldn't be suffering. No, there really would. <laughs> it might be different, but it would certainly be there. But realizing that in all of that, what God is doing is that he's, he's drawing us to himself. 
he's drawing us to himself. Mm. And uh, that's, that's where we belong, really. And so uh, our goal remains the same, you know, that being God. And, and his goal remains the same, that being us. We, we are in his sight and constantly uh, on his mind, and, and he knows us, and he knows our sufferings. Mm, beautifully said. And I love the applications that Pope Francis made in this homily for the people of Kazakhstan. As he said, this land has experienced other kinds of painful bites in its history. I think of the fiery serpents of violence, atheistic persecution, and all those troubled times when people's freedom was threatened and their dignity offended. We do well to keep alive the memory of those sufferings and not forget certain grim moments. And it's helpful for us to remember, uh, for us who haven't been through that kind of thing in our uh, recent history, uh, recent memory, it's helpful for us to, to see what is happening in other parts of the world. And also to think of violence, atheistic persecution, when people's freedom is threatened and dignity offended, to think of those things as this, this kind of suffering, as these fiery serpents, as these painful bites in history. Um, I think... We're, we're always seems on the edge of some of these things in our own country and certain freedoms being uh, threatened, if not restricted. And certainly uh, there being outbreaks of violence at different times. I think of uh, some of the, the violence in the streets and the uh, during, during COVID and, and uh, certainly uh, violence in, Eastern Europe, and in fact, uh, while the Pope was in Kazakhstan, violence broke out between Azerbaijan and Armenia. There's so much of that. And we can look at that and throw up our hands in despair, or we can exempt ourselves and say it happens to somebody else, or uh, when it happens to us, we can uh, just focus on fighting better and winning the battle. But I think to look at it in this light, in the light of faith, to see these as, as serpents, that are that are rising up that we need to keep an eye on because Pope Francis's point just after this he says peace is never achieved once and for all it has to be renewed anew each achieved anew each day and so if we're going to prevent some of those things from continuing to happen then we have to make the decision today wherever we live to cultivate peace and uh, for me, that always comes into a place of, of mutual understanding. I certainly notice uh, the way that even in my own institution where, you know, I mean, there's there's basically peace here at St. Vincent College Seminary, Arch Abbey Parish, but it's easy to start to form ideas about people you don't talk too much. And then when you get a pointed email or you get a cold shoulder or you get a little reaction, then it becomes a point of resistance and resentment. And, and then suddenly, you know, walls can build up and... These are very small compared to war between the Ukraine and Russia. But uh, this is the kind of place that each of us lives in. And how are we really managing, cultivating those, those relationships that we're involved in? Are we doing it in a way that there's connection, peace, mutual understanding? Uh, or are we building division and, and separating ourselves between, uh, with, with walls of resentment? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, well, I'm glad to hear that there's largely peace at St. Vincent. <laughs> I, 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 I would agree my, my years there. Uh, no, it was, it was a blessing, but it's amazing how even at, in, in a good situation, in a good, healthy community, a good, healthy family, a uh, good, healthy parish, things of that sort, where these things really can s slip in. They can sneak in and, and really distort uh, not only the image that we have of God, but the image that we have of others. We are, we are made in God's image and likeness. And so whenever we begin to see these things start to, start to creep in, uh, it can certainly distort uh, our image of, of others. But I, I will say that even within that whole section that you just mentioned, so I, I had uh, a lot of what you just read I had underlined as well because I thought it was really good to, to point out the kind of larger scale warfare and things of that, these different kinds of painful bites in a manner of speaking, but that his remedy to that, he says at the end of that section, yet even before that, we need to renew our faith in the Lord and look upwards. Because that's the thing about all these kinds of uh, outbreaks, wars, persecutions of, of any sort, is that we tend to then be hyper-focused on those things themselves, focused on the violence itself, focused on the persecution itself, focused on the atheistic movements themselves, 
when really he's inviting us to look upwards. What comes to mind is a kind of imagery of of a funnel, you know, and the more you kind of spiral down the funnel, the the sharper the angle becomes and the more uh, enclosed things become and and the darker things become. And really the only way out is is, is to look up, uh, and and that's where where the light is. And it's the same thing within families, communities, uh, friendships, that whenever, you know, things uh, and, and human beings being yes, weak and, and, and sinful, uh, inclined towards sin. Uh, occasionally, whenever those things creep in, it, it sort of uh, begins a sort, a sort of spiral, you know, somewhat downward. But if we're constantly looking up and constantly looking to the Lord and renewing our trust and renewing our faith in Him, we see God more and more fully for who He is and then more and more fully see others for who they are. And really, uh, that's, that's kind of the counter to what's going on here because... Pope Francis pointing out that these uh, painful bites in history, violence, atheistic persecution, these troubled times, it, it says it threatens people's freedom and their dignity. And so renewing that by looking to the Lord, we renew our own dignity, we renew the dignity of others in our hearts and in our minds. And really, uh, that's kind of the, the, the process of, uh, of freedom within our own souls, is to see God as he is to see others as they are, to see ourselves as we are. Hmm, beautifully said. And as, as Pope Francis continues his homily, he presses into that, that question, well, why, why does God deal with things in these ways? Why doesn't he just get rid of the serpents? It's, it's such an unexpected thing for him to say to Moses, now create a serpent out of bronze and lift it up and What's that all about? Why doesn't he just get rid of them if he wants the, the Israelites to, to have that, that remedy? And ultimately, that's fulfilled in Jesus as, as Pope Francis develops in his subsequent uh, paragraphs of teaching in this homily that, that Jesus would take our sin on himself then, and gazing upon him, we would see that, that sin. Uh, I think also connected with this idea of trust that ultimately the remedy for the the spiritual serpents that bite us is this process of trust and we god can't do the trusting for us that's the thing he can be trustworthy he can earn our trust but we have to make the decision to trust and how does that happen how do you develop trust other than by trusting and so it's a uh, the invitation to trust him to follow the instructions to look up and to see how it unfolds and that's, uh, that's where the Lord is, is leading us in whatever the situation is in our own lives. Not to simply throw up our hands, not to use the nuclear option, not to run the other way, but to look at it and to find God in the midst of it. Sometimes we're tempted to look for God somewhere else, as if God is not in this difficulty, that somehow this difficulty is merely an obstacle on my path to God. I'll find God after I get through this difficulty. But we really learn from these passages and the Pope's homily that God is in the midst of it. Jesus Christ enters right into the midst of our, our situation, and we can find him there. Yeah, certainly. It can sometimes be uh, a temptation within a temptation uh, as far as when we experience temptations, hardships, trials, to simply think that the the way out of them is to not have them, and yet, in a manner of speaking, they are... <laughs> They are a way to the Lord. And yet, you know, it's also okay to pray and, and ask the Lord to remove these things. You know, both uh, our Lord did in the, in the agony of the garden, uh, if it would be possible for this cup to pass for me, and yet, yet not my will, but your will be done. So uh, both asking and petitioning, and yet surrender. And same thing with St. Paul in Second Corinthians 12, whenever, you know, he has the thorn in the side, and, and he says, three times I asked the Lord to remove this from me, yet he responded, my grace is sufficient for you. Okay. So it's, it's both a combination of mm. petitioning and asking, of, like, Lord, I'm suffering here, I have this pain, this, this hardship, can you remove it from me? So, so yeah, in a manner of speaking, those serpents, uh, it would have been fine for them to pray, simply remove the serpents, yet God, in, in his wisdom, saw that there was still something uh, about having them around that in the grand scheme of things would be for their good, perhaps as a, as a reminder to constantly be turning to God uh, of, or of their need for God or, or turning to Him. 
uh, you know, and maybe not getting caught up in thinking that this is bliss and this is it just because we don't have serpents around and then all of a sudden they forget God again. But what's important, I think, that even amidst serpents and biting things still being around us, even though Jesus has conquered all sin and death, you know, again, the words of St. Paul in Second Corinthians, uh, this comes from Second Corinthians 5, he says, we are always courageous. Although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we are always courageous. And so it's, it takes incredible courage to be able to face and navigate the serpents in our lives and the suffering and the trials uh, in faith. You know, not walking by sight. Clearly, we see so many things around us uh, at a very real level, you know, within uh, our, our families, our communities, even our churches, and even a larger, grander scale within our, our nation and within the world. We walk by faith, not by sight, not by the things we see around us, but by faith in the Lord, and we walk with courage. It's a beautiful reference to Jesus' words to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And drawing us on in that act of trust and reaching out to the Lord. As I mentioned, it's not a quick fix. It's not like when you say that magical prayer, everything gets better and all the pain goes away. It really is a matter of, of carrying our cross. And as you said earlier, uh, not an easy life, but an easy yoke. The, the yoke is there. We live within the restrictions of this world, the restrictions of our humanity, the, the, the limitations of our own human poverty. We, we don't get away from those things in this world, but we do develop trust in the midst of it. And that trust partners us with God in a way that he is able to also support us and carry us. And, and that becomes the great joy of being Christian, that we don't give in to the, the venom as uh, Pope Francis develops it, not biting one another, complaining, blaming, backbiting, disseminating evil, polluting the earth with sin and distrust that comes from the evil one. We learn to live without the venom, and that makes our lives better. And we know that, at least from others, and, and I'm sure from our own experience, when we're able to live things, not on the one hand in a kind of suppressive, controlled, accommodated way, uh, let alone uh, an expressive, uh, grumbling, complaining, explosive way, but, but we live with the honesty about it's hard, the pain that we're suffering, whatever we're going to. Maybe it's a consequence of our own sin and distrust. Maybe we've gone astray like the Israelites did. Maybe it's the consequence of somebody else's sin and distrust. We're, we're suffering as innocent victims like Jesus of what others have done. Whatever it is, it's, uh, we, can, we can face that and we can live it with Jesus. We can ask for his help to keep moving forward and, and make our way through this uh, painful and difficult chapter of our lives. But we have a reason for hope, and that hope makes such a difference. It keeps us from devolving into some of those other ways of trying to discharge pain and suffering through blame and backbiting and, and resentment and, and complaining. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's why I think that uh, I, I love how Pope Francis really kind of ends th this uh, juxtaposition of the serpents that bite, the serpent that saves, and he really ultimately says, this is the path. He says, this is the path to our salvation, our rebirth, our resurrection, to behold the crucified Jesus. And he says, for from the cross of Christ we learn love. I think that's such an important element to all of this. You know, Christ being crucified was the greatest act of love. And so somehow in the great mystery of things it is that willingly accepting suffering uh, in the will of the Father and that, that surrender is an act of love. You know, the very first thing that St. Paul says is that love is patient, First Corinthians 13, of that whole litany of all the things that he says love is, that it's patient, that it's kind, it's not envious, it's not boastful. <clears throat> he says that love is patient, and patient doesn't just mean uh, waiting or not being in a hurry, you know, patience, uh, at least in the original Greek, long-suffering, long-suffering. That, that's what love is, that, that willingness to be in it for the long haul and to be able to suffer the weaknesses of others, suffer one's own weaknesses, that long-suffering. And so really the cross is, is a kind of school of love. Uh, it's a demonstration of love as far as Christ 
and his action, his saving action for us. But for us, the crosses in our lives are, are a kind of school of love, a way of learning to love God and, and love each other through patience, that long suffering for the sake of other. Mm, beautiful. Then the word uh, patience, of course, carries the word suffering in it. Uh, patio, patio, passion, and that suffering that we go through when we endure difficult situations. And as you offered that other translation, Father Mike, long suffering really gives us a, a sense of what that involves. And and we all have the experience, or uh, I hope, that some of what it's like when someone has suffered for us, when someone has waited for us, when someone has endured uh, our perhaps going astray or our difficulties, who has sat up with us, or maybe a, a mother who stayed with us all night when we were sick or sat with us in a doctor's office and someone who has waited for us to work through whatever issues we might have and, and reconcile a relationship. And it's such a gift. We really experience the gift of being loved like that. And so also the, the Lord wants to uh, invite us into that place for him and for others, that we would learn that kind of long suffering. And we learn that from the cross of Christ. And as Pope Francis says, we learn a number of things there. Love, not hatred. Compassion, not indifference. Forgiveness, not vengeance. Just those three things are a great help to us. Love, compassion, forgiveness, not hatred, indifference, or vengeance. That indifference especially is so easy for those who are uh, living in a somewhat luxurious society that we have here in the United States with a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities and I certainly put myself high up in that uh, experience it can be so easy to insulate ourselves and just not care what's going on in other people's lives but we're so enriched when we respond with compassion love and when we've been wronged and we have been there are genuine wrongs and we don't deny that at all but then to feel the wrong, to estimate the pain, but offer forgiveness, to hand the person over to God. Let him right the wrong. Let him bring justice to the space of injustice. So beautiful, concrete applications that, that Pope Francis gives us here. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I see it as well, uh, as you were saying, you know, just as an invitation, uh, an invitation of God. Right after that section uh, of learning to love, not hatred, compassion, not indifference, forgiveness, not vengeance, he talks about the outstretched arms of Jesus, the embrace of tender love uh, that God wishes to embrace us with. And just this past weekend, of course, the beautiful reading from Luke 15 of the prodigal son and, and looking to the merciful father, it, it's beautiful to see that this imagery of, of the outstretched arms of, of Jesus on the cross, in addition to those open arms of, of the Father as the Son returned. You know, in each case, you know, whether it be due to our own sin, due to uh, the suffering that we experience in our own lives, the arms of God are open. The arms of Jesus are, are outstretched to embrace us. Uh, and the arms of, of God the Father, as we return to Him, are open to us. You know, that, that younger son who had gone astray, yeah, it, it was largely his own fault, his, his own choosing, and there was suffering a, along with that. You know, his, his suffering was a kind of a self-induced cross, if you will, and just by his own choosing, and, and yet he returned. He returned to the open arms of his father who had compassion, exactly what Pope Francis talked about here, compassion, not indifference, and forgiveness, not vengeance, which he easily could have had. The father easily could have... Uh, you know, written him off and, and had this vengeful and indifferent uh, approach to him just because of his choices, and yet with outstretched arms, the Father embraced him. And with outstretched arms, Jesus not only suffered for us, but in, invites us more deeply into his divine life. Mm, beautifully said. Well, Father Mike, we're just coming to the end of our time, and uh, I wonder if you could lead us in a, a prayer and offer a blessing as we wrap up our program. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I uh, just pray for God's blessing upon uh, all of our listeners, and we just take a moment to pray now. God, our Father, you have blessed us in so many ways, and we're so grateful for the many graces in our lives. We pray for openness of heart 
especially to those hidden graces, the graces that we sometimes see and, and are obviously sufferings, difficulties. But we offer those to you. We pray for the grace, especially to keep our eyes simply fixed on you. Help us to grow in love, compassion, and forgiveness and to embrace the crosses that you have in mind for us. And we pray, Lord, for simply the courage to endure, to be patient, to love, and to follow you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strengths. We pray for your blessing upon all those listening, friends, family, upon our communities, our church, our country, and our world. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Father Mike Fakes, thank you so much for talking with me about Pope Francis's homily for September 14th, 2022, from Kazakhstan on the triumph of the cross. It's been beautiful to spend this time with you. Thanks so much. It's been a blessing for me as well. Thank you so much.